Hi everyone, welcome to Esoteric Tech. This video is going to be covering the differences between compiled and interpreted languages. I want to encourage you to like and subscribe if you find this video to be helpful, which I think you will. So without further ado, let's get started. At this point, hopefully you already understand that programming languages are just instructions to the computer. Nothing more, nothing less. Uh, computers do exactly what you tell them to do. And, and that holds true regardless of what language you choose, whether it's JavaScript, Python, Go, Bass, all just instructions. Uh, the thing about programming languages is that they aren't inherently understood by computers. Uh, the styling and the syntax of, of those languages are designed so that humans can understand them. And for that reason, uh, they're known as high-level languages. Uh, now I can maybe do a video later on and the difference between a high level and low level language. Uh, but the point is computers don't understand high level languages. They don't they don't understand the, the code that we actually write. What they understand is something called machine code. And that's typically represented by hexadecimal or binary. And that's considered a low level language. In fact, it's it's the lowest level and it is specific to the operating system. So the machine code of a 64-bit Mac is different than the machine code of a Windows 64-bit, right? And so we understand high level. Computer understands low level. Uh, in order to get from high to low or, or high to machine code, a translation has to occur. And that's the focus of this video. Uh, that translation can occur by compiling the language or interpreting it uh, the difference between the two is how and when that translation happens. Let's start with an explanation of a compiled language using a cooking analogy. Uh, imagine this is your friend who is an incredible chef and he's interested in cooking a popular American dish. Uh, but the problem is he only understands Spanish, a, a very specific dialect of Spanish, and the recipe is in English. So he gives you the entire cookbook. Uh, the cookbook containing the recipe and ask you to translate it from English to Spanish. Uh, you translate it and then give him that translated cookbook. He's then able to basically go in, find the recipe he wants and follow those instructions line by line. So a few points here that I want to emphasize that are specific to this analogy of a compiled language. One, you have translated the entire cookbook, despite the fact that he only needs one recipe, okay? Two, you translate specifically for the dialect that that chef speaks, right? He's very specific, very particular. If you use any other dialect, he doesn't understand slang. If you use any of that, uh, he's, he's likely going to mess up the recipe. In fact, he, he won't even attempt the recipe. It's got to be specific. And then three, he doesn't start cooking. In fact, he doesn't do anything until you are done translating the entire cookbook. Now, each part of that analogy represents some tool or component of the compilation workflow. The English recipe represents the source code, which is the code written by the developer. You represent the compiler, which is really the most important part of this equation, and that gets installed during the initial installation of the language. The translated cookbook represents the artifact that gets produced from compiling the source code. And, and by artifact, that's just a term used to refer to um, anything that gets produced by you know running a program or executing some software. Uh, that's the output of compiling the source code. And that file is known as an executable. It's also referred to as a binary file. And then the chef following the instructions, that's representative of the computer executing the translated instructions contained in the binary file. Okay, so uh, there are plenty of compiled languages out there. These are just a few examples. And as with any programming language or tool or technology, there are, there are always going to be pros and cons. So let's discuss the pros. Uh, one of the most well-known benefits of compiled languages is the faster execution time versus an interpreted language. Uh, and the reason for that is because all of the code is translated before the computer attempts to execute it, right? So this goes back to the fact that I said you translate the entire cookbook, right? And so at this point, the cook 
just follows the instructions written in his native language. There's nothing else that he needs, right? He, he's not waiting on anyone else or anything. Uh, he can just breeze through it. And that brings me to my next point, which is that we can execute that binary file on the target machine without the compiler or source code. You can't create it without that, right? You need the compiler and source code to create that executable, but you can run it without that. And that's because when a program is compiled, it has to be compiled for a specific operating system and architecture. And when I say specific, I mean a specific version, right? It's not enough to specify Windows, Linux, or Mac. It has to be, you know, Windows, 64-bit, you know, Intel processor or Mac, 64-bit uh, Intel processor, right? Uh, and so once you compile that for a certain, o certain OS, uh, you can send that file to anyone with that OS and they should be able to run it no problem. And that means the execution of the program is kind of lightweight from that perspective, right? No other components are needed. Now, another key benefit is that in order to distribute a compiled program, you don't have to distribute your source code. If you're concerned about people having access to your original code to redistribute it or alter it, compilation can be an obstacle to that. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier that the translation step results in machine code, and so it's not super easy for humans to read that, uh, but the key word there is obstacle. It's not an impenetrable wall. People can absolutely reverse compile programs. There are programs to do that. Uh, and just as a fun fact, that's how some people are able to cheat on online video games. They can uh, reverse compile the code, change something about it, right? So they find the piece in the code that says, if I get shot, my health goes down. They change that to say that their health is unaffected, right? They compile it again, run the program, and then people are wondering why this person can't die in this video game, right? And that's just one use of it, right? Not all... Uh, situation in which people are reverse compiling. That's not always nefarious. The last benefit that I'll list here is compile time errors. And this is an interesting one. Uh, whenever I do these tutorials, I always seek out other tutorials on this subject and try to see if there's something that maybe they've omitted in their, their information that I can include or expand on in mine. And this is definitely a point that for whatever reason, I see omitted from other tutorials when discussing compiled languages, uh, and it's definitely a benefit. Uh, compiled languages or compile time errors, as the name implies, uh, are errors that the compiler catches when the program is actually compiling. Uh, the alternative to this is runtime errors, and those are errors that occur during execution of the program. And runtime errors are the worst kind. You want to stay away from those because that means you're you know, someone's actually trying to execute your program. So going back to the recipe analogy, if you can catch a, a duplicate line or a misspelled word while the recipe is being translated, I'd say that's definitely better than catching it while you're cooking the recipe. And those are the type of errors a lot of times that the compiler will catch. So it catches syntax errors or, or things that don't make sense uh, or don't align with the rules of that programming language. Uh, it also is closely related to whether or not your your language is a dynamic language, dynamically typed or statically typed. Uh, a lot of people assume that if something or language is compiled, it's automatically statically typed. That is not always the case. Uh, you, there are dynamically typed compiled languages. Uh, but in my experiences, I've always worked with statically typed compiled languages. Whatever the case, it's, it's good to catch those errors before you run the program. It's kind of like having a second set of eyes uh, before you actually try to execute it. As for the cons of compiled languages, well, the first two kind of go hand in hand. Uh, compiling does take time. Uh, and that time is dependent on the size of your program. Uh, and also, you have to recompile it after each change. The compiled version of your program uh, is reflective of whatever the source code was when you compiled it. So any changes that take place after that uh, requires that you recompile that in order to uh, get a new you know, version of that program.
And then the last disadvantage is that the binary files that are created will only run on the operating system that they were compiled for. So if you want to create a program that runs on multiple operating systems, you're going to have to compile it that many times. And, and that assumes that you have a programming language or a build tool that allows you to specify the operating system and architecture that you want to compile the program for. All right, so let's talk about interpreted languages. And I'm going to stick with the same analogy. Uh, so we've got a chef that speaks Spanish, an English recipe. You're still going to be the translator. However, in this case, instead of translating the entire book and then allowing the chef to find the recipe and cook the meal, what you're doing this time is translating just the recipe. And you're not translating it all at one time. You're translating it line by line and giving him each instruction line by line to perform immediately after you translate that line. Right. So again, English recipe is the source code. Instead of being the compiler, this time you represent the interpreter, which still gets installed uh, typically during the initial installation of the programming language. But there are other ways that it may be installed as well. Uh, could be a part of the browser in the case of JavaScript. Uh, and then for the machine code, we don't have a binary file or some artifact that gets created because we're immediately uh, translating that line, compiling a line of code, and the computer executes that, right? So in this case, it's like you're get, you're translating the line that says, boil some water, you give them that, give the chef that line, and that's what he does. Then you translate the next line that says, add a dash of salt, you give them that line, and that's what he does, right? So it's a line by line translation. Now let's talk about the pros and cons. And actually, one more thing before we move on to the next diagram. On the bottom right hand corner it says compiled specifically for that operating system and that that's not a typo even though we're talking about interpreted languages it still gets compiled the the programming definition of compiled is uh, translating from a high level language to a lower level language and we still do that here the difference is that we don't have that intermediary step of you know some some uh, artifact that gets produced that represents the entire compiled version but we still have to do that translation and so even though we attach these labels of interpreted and compiled languages there kind of is a lot of uh, crossover it's not a clearly defined line between the two and I'm going to talk more about that at the very end of this video now if you're watching this video and you're thinking to yourself you know I've never worked with an interpreted language before well, if you've used Bash or ZSH or FIS or any of the other Unix shells, then you actually have uh, because those aren't just Unix shells. Those are shell interpreters. They're, they're interpreting and executing each command that you give it. Uh, and these are just a couple other examples of interpreted languages. Uh, as for the pros, first one I'll list here is that it is portable. You can run the program of an interpreted language on another computer as long as that computer has the interpreter installed on it. Now I can already hear some confusion about that, that benefit right there because I can hear someone saying, well, I mentioned that compiled languages could also be run on other computers. So it seems like both of them are portable. And in a sense they are but they're kind of portable in different ways. And I, I think this explanation deserves its own diagram. So I'm gonna hop off of this slide for a second and then come back to it. So let's go over just the general workflow for distributing a program written with an interpreted language. And I'm gonna use Python as an example. So in this case, typically the developer is gonna download and install the language version that they wanna work with and they're going to install an interpreter that is specific to that language and specific to their operating system. So if they're installing Python 3.2 and they're working on a Windows 64-bit OS, they're going to install a Windows 64-bit Python interpreter for Python 3.2. They'll write their source code, and then when they want to distribute that program, what they'll share is the source code, the actual Python file, that they've written. Now let's say the intended user of that program has a 64-bit Mac. Well, in order to run that program, they're going to need to install a Mac 64-bit Python interpreter for Python 
So in the case of the user, they're going to have to install something, but they aren't dependent on the developer providing some version of the software or program for their operating system. And the key takeaway here is that for the interpreter to translate that Python file, it needs to understand how to speak the language of the operating system that it's being run on. And I also want to point out, this is just a general outline for interpreted languages. It's not exactly the same for every interpreted language. For example, JavaScript, uh, the interpreter actually is built right into the browser. So you don't have to install something separate. And the distributed code in that case comes in the form of some web page that, that's loaded onto your browser. Uh, but in that case, it's still being directly uh, interpreted and run right there in that browser. And that makes sense, right? You don't want uh, the JavaScript, you know, having to compile an entire web page in order to do one thing, right? We expect our browsers to be quick and our, our web requests to be, to be fast. Now, the workflow for a compiled program is a little different. In this case, the developer is going to download and install a language and compiler that is specific to their OS. Uh, then they're going to write their source code, and then they're going to compile it for a specific operating system. And this could be different than the one that they're working on. So if the developer is on a Windows 64 bit, they can provide an argument to the compiler to say, I want to compile this source code for a Mac 64 bit OS. And when they distribute that binary, again, that, that executable file is specific to whatever they compiled it for. And the user must have that version in order to execute that version of the binary. And so, as I said before, the user doesn't need to install anything, right? They can just run it as is because that code is already translated into the native language of their operating system. Now, back to the pros of interpreted languages. Uh, they are easier to debug. And what I mean by that is that uh, you can actually debug the runtime code, the actual code that's in production. Whereas with compiled languages, you're not really debugging the runtime code, you're debugging the source code. And Ideally, those should be the same thing, but that's an assumption. It assumes that you uh, know what version was compiled. You understand the arguments that was given to the compiler. Uh, but if you don't, then those could be separate versions. So from that perspective, uh, an interpreted language is easier to debug. And that kind of goes hand in hand with the next one, which is that there's no need to compile the entire program before executing, right? You can just run it. And so you don't have to go through that step. Now on to the cons. And the first one I'm going to list here is actually the same one that I listed in the pros column, but I got to list it. it. It's portable, but only if the interpreter is installed on the target operating system. And I, I've got to add that here because that is a step. That's something that has to be done in order to run this program on any other machine. Right. Uh, next one, and maybe this one could have been the first one because I think it's the most well-known disadvantage of interpreted languages, which is that the program will actually execute slower. And that makes sense if you think about it. Going back to the recipe analogy, you can imagine that there might be some instructions that take longer to interpret than they do to actually perform. When I talk about um, adding a dash of salt, that probably takes longer to write than it does to actually do. And then right after the chef adds that dash of salt, which is a really quick action, he's standing there waiting for the next line to be translated. And that's the same thing that happens with computers. Computer has to wait for those lines to be translated as opposed to being able to execute line after line because each line is already translated in the case of compiled languages. If you don't want to expose your source code, well, then there are some extra steps involved in that. By default, the thing you're sharing when you distribute an interpreted or a program written with an interpreted language is the source code, right? So there, there'd be some steps required there. And then uh, there are only runtime errors. Runtime errors itself isn't bad, but uh, the fact that you'll, you don't get the benefit of compile time errors before running the program, that's the disadvantage. Now that pretty much sums up the key points around interpreted and compiled languages. We've gone through the definition, the pros and the cons, and hopefully you're able to make a decision for your application. Couple caveats I gotta mention though. One, as I mentioned earlier,
not all languages fall nicely into one category or the other. In fact, there are what's called intermediate languages. C Sharp and Java are an example. And this is just kind of a quick diagram that illustrates what happens. But in those languages, uh, during that initial compilation, they actually get compiled into this intermediary language. So they don't get compiled all the way down to machine code. And then during execution of the program, you have some other tool known as the just-in-time compiler, which actually compiles it the rest of the way during that execution. So that's kind of kind of an in-between there, which is, of course, why it's known as an intermediate language. Uh, and then also even the terms interpreted and compiled, we, we label these languages, you know, with with those with those terms. But the truth is, the, the programming language is actually separate from those from those terms, right? Uh, the language is just, you know, the code, the actual syntax, but, you know, how it gets translated, that's dependent on the tool that's used. And the truth is, there are uh, interpreters for compiled languages, there are compilers for interpreted languages, you can absolutely compile Python. In fact, that's a common use case for it, right? So again, you can't really say all languages fall into one or the other because it's based on some tool and people are creating new tools all the time. And then lastly, uh, hopefully this doesn't, uh, hopefully this doesn't disappoint anyone. But if you're hoping for me to pick one or the other and tell you which one's better, well, I can't because the solution depends on the use case, right? And so that's why I've got this diagram here of a hammer versus a screwdriver because it's kind of the same question. You can't you can't answer that question without understanding it. And unfortunately, a lot of people are doing that. They're trying to use a, a hammer on a screw because the hammer is the only tool in their toolbox. So if someone tells you, you know, 100% compiled languages are the best or interpreted languages are the best, get away from that person. You should run as fast as you can. And I, maybe I'm not going to say you should run from that person because it could be your your mom or your sister or something like that. But I'll say you should be skeptical on their programming advice. And that I can actually say pretty definitively. With that said, thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it. Let me know your comments or questions. Please do like and subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next tutorial on Esoteric Tech. At this point, hopefully you already understand that programming languages are just instructions to the computer. Nothing more, nothing less. Uh, computer